Through advocacy, education, training, communication, research, and ongoing community building, ALP proudly supports every producer in our province and has since 1972. We are recording this webinar and we will make it available on our website uh, sometime next week. So you'll be able to watch it again if you want to, if you think you've missed anything, or if anyone wasn't able to attend the live broadcast, they can watch the later recording of it. So please feel free to tell your friends and neighbors about it. This webinar is called Feeding Your Flocks When Hay is Limited, and we're lucky to have Dale Langstrom here with us today to present on this timely topic. I'll be turning uh, over the microphone to Dale in a few minutes, but first I wanted to give a few housekeeping notes. When I turn the microphone over to Dale, he'll also replace me at the top or the side of the screen there. So you should be able to see him as well as the PowerPoint presentation behind. If you're having trouble with the audio, you can call in the toll-free number that we are showing here. Um, and you can call in that on your phone, but keep the computer up with the slides. So here's a look at our agenda for the morning. Following Dale's presentation, we'll have uh, lots of times for questions and answers. And I think actually he's got a part in his presentation where uh, midway through we'll, we'll tackle some questions as well. But uh, anytime during the presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in your questions. Type in your questions and we'll get them answered. Uh, again, you don't have to wait till the end of the presentation. You can start asking them now. You can start asking them in five minutes. Anytime you have a question, just type it in. And here's where you do that. So you can see on your little uh, uh, GoToWebinar panel control box, there is a section that says questions. You simply type in your question there and, uh, and hit send, and we get those questions. And we're able to, uh, to tell them to Dale, and that's how we'll answer your questions. Right either above or below that question box, you see something called handouts. So we do have a handout in there for all of you. These are Dale's notes to the presentation, so you're welcome to download those handouts. You can print them off um, and keep them with you for a later date. So a big thank you to Growing Forward 2 for providing the funding to help deliver this webinar. Growing Forward 2 is a federal, provincial, territorial initiative. So we're almost ready to get Dale on the line now, but before we do, we have two quick polls to start off with. So I'm going to ask the first question here. You should see it coming up on your screen. Have you secured enough good quality forage for your winter supply? Yes, no, or unsure. So if everyone can take a couple minutes to answer the questions here. Okay, so it looks like we've got about 45% of you who are unsure, 36% of you say yes, and 18% of you say no. So we've got a good mix here. And one more question before we get going. Have you tested your forage supply this fall? Again, just going to give you a couple minutes to answer it. These questions are going to help Dale to know where everyone in our audience today is sitting at with their feed. Just 
going to give it one more second. Looks like a couple of you are still haven't voted. Okay, so again here we've got about 73% of people who say no they haven't, 27% say yes they have. Okay, so great. Thanks everyone for answering our poll questions. We are ready now to turn the mic over to Dale. So I've got the pleasure of introducing Dale Engstrom. He's worked with ALP for years and uh, I know that he has his own biography slide where he's going to tell you more about himself. So uh, without any further ado, I will turn things over to Dale. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, it's uh, my thanks out to Alberta Land Producers and those of you who are participating this morning. Um, we certainly uh, are enjoying this experience. It's a little bit nerve-wracking. It's interesting that I find this more nerve-wracking than, uh, than if you were here in person. So uh, we will um, see how that works out. Anyway, um, Thank you for participating. I see we've got a few pr producers here that are, have signed in, and um, we'll go from there. I made this presentation or a similar presentation to a group of producers in Grand Prairie um, a couple weeks ago, and again, it was stimulated by the concern over our drought situation here in Alberta earlier on and the lack of uh, conventional feed supplies that producers are working with. So, so who is Dale Engstrom? Well, there you can see a picture of myself and my, my wonder dog. Um, I've been a cattle producer and a sheep producer uh, earlier on in my career when, when I lived up in the BC Peace Country. Uh, I then went to Alberta Agriculture where I was the beef and sheep nutritionist for 12 years. Uh, currently retired from Alberta Agriculture, uh, doing some nutritional consultation for some producers which I enjoy and also writing a column for Sheep Canada magazine. And as Robin suggested, I've done some things for Alberta lamb here the last few years too that again have been very enjoyable. One of the things that Alberta Lamb has done a good job of uh, over the last few years is providing a lot of uh, good resource materials. And this particular product called the Sheep and Goat Management in Alberta, the Nutrition Module, or SGMA-N, uh, is available from Alberta Lamb. There's the website. You can uh, order a hard copy or download uh, chapters from that. But uh, it gives you a good basic understanding of, uh, of nutrition. Uh, I wasn't involved personally in, in uh, developing that resource, but it certainly is uh, something that I recommend people take advantage of and use uh, whenever they have some questions about nutrition. Outline for the presentation this morning, uh, eight or nine different uh, topics there that I'm going to touch briefly on. Uh, in just an hour, we can't get into a lot of depth uh, with any one of these uh, areas, but uh, hopefully I can give you some ideas and some tips and some things to do and things to try to avoid. So that's the outline that we're going to go through here in the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes with a, a stop in the middle for questions and certainly ad adequate time at the end uh, for questions as well. I always like to start my sheep talks with a little bit of admiration for the, for the beast it, itself. Uh, in my opinion, sheep are special creatures and deserve your special care and management as any animal would. But one thing we have to remind ourselves is that they're not mini beef cows. Their nutritional requirements, their productivity in particular, supported by a good nutrition, far exceeds the, the beef cow, uh, especially when you get into the more prolific breeds. So we have to make sure that we just don't compartmentalize them in our minds as, as little beef cows. Certainly they can eat a lot of the same feedstuffs, but they do require a little bit more attention to, to good nutrition. Here's an example. Relative output of offspring. So a you delivering twins at birth is delivering 10% of her body weight in the weight of the lambs themselves, the newborn lambs. Quite easily she can do that. And you can see, and what surprises me here, is that that's even more output per unit of body weight than the sow over on the left, and certainly quite a bit more than the beef cow as well. But what if she has triplets? Is it going to be 15% or more of her body weight? One example with one of my producers uh, where I've seen a healthy set of quads, four lambs born, and they amounted to 23% of the ewe's body weight. So a lot of nutritional demand, especially in late gestation, uh, on that ewe, and that's one of the things we'll talk about a little bit more here. But we certainly have to appreciate, I believe, that sheep are special creatures and deserve your special care and management but there is no free lunch. Productivity requires good nutrition and good management in the other areas as well. 
So keep, please keep that in mind that we've got productive little creatures here if we really want to treat them as, as well as they deserve. A couple of comments to start off. Feeding through a feed shortage may be the biggest challenge you've ever faced. So I'm glad to see you have tuned in. Using low quality roughage and grain diets in place of good quality forages that you normally use will require all your nutritional knowledge and skill. And you will need to use your powers of observation during the winter feeding period more than ever. You've got to pay attention to what the sheep are telling you, uh, the feedback you'll get. And we'll touch on a few of these items in a bit more detail as we proceed through the, uh, through the webinar. First of all, culling the flock I think is the first place to start when you're dealing with feed shortage or feed quality shortage. Uh, the outcome here will be fewer mouths to feed, of course, uh, less cash outlay to purchase uh, supplemental feeds. Uh, that would be required. You're also going to end up by proper culling with stronger sheep, stronger mouths to feed, so to speak. This will result in stronger newborn lambs that thrive without extra work on your part, adequate milk to grow out the lambs, and, and fewer animal welfare issues that crop up occasionally when we see a, a year like this when there is certainly feed shortages around. So that's the objective of culling. Who goes and who stays? Well, obviously, the old and infirm, even if they're not worth much on the market, you know, I know it's hard to get good value out of cull use today, but uh, there's no point in feeding them if they're going to be difficult to feed. Um, they're hard to feed on straw-based rations. And what you need to do to get, uh, to make sure that you don't have old and infirm use around is check for the full mouth, make sure they haven't lost any of their teeth, and, of course, their body condition score. And their body condition score should be uh, at least two and a half to three right now and improving as we get a little bit closer to lambing. Uh, ewe lambs is another thing that can be culled and it's really not culling when you talk about selling the, the productive part of your flock in that manner. But they are worth cash on the market, either as replacements to somebody that wants them perhaps or as, uh, as market lambs themselves. Another reason for getting rid of them is that they are much harder to feed successfully on straw-based rations. And we'll talk about grouping them separately and what the demands are for those ewe lambs. But um, hard to feed replacement ewe lambs on, on low-quality roughages uh, or if you have to go to the extreme using straw as your only roughage. You might have to sell off some of your good prime ewes as well as needed to fit the feed supply or what you can obtain as a feed supply. Really, you have to face the facts. Hope is not a strategy. Don't hope that we're going to have a mild winter or a short winter. Don't hope the neighbor is going to sell his cows and be able to sell you his, his good feed. Hope is not a strategy. Face the facts when it comes to culling this time of year and facing a feed shortage. When should the flock be culled? Well, last week probably is the best time to have done it. Uh, some of the producers in the Grand Prairie session have already done that, and uh, that was pleasant to hear. The next best time is next week or as soon as possible. But keep in mind that it's much more profitable for you to feed fewer sheep well, doing a good job, getting good lambs out of them, than feeding more sheep poorly. Second thing I want to touch bases on here is a little bit about basic ruminant nutrition. Just have to remind ourselves that each cc of rumen fluid contains 10 to 50 billion microbes. That's just teeming with microbes that do the bulk of the work when it comes to digesting feeds for the sheep then to, to utilize. 80 to 100% of nutrients consumed by the sheep are cycled through the microbes first. So they digest, break down the feed, take the nutrients out of it, build their own body material with those nutrients, and, uh, and then feed the sheep on those nutrients. So the box on the right here, the nutrients come into the sheep. Microbial digestion occurs with these 50 billion strong little army of, of microbes breaks that, uh, those feed ingredients down to ammonia, NH3, which is then reformed into microbial protein, the body of the microbes themselves, and another group of uh, what we call organic acids that are absorbed directly and is the main energy source of the, uh, of the sheep. Different microbes are there for different purposes. There's a group of microbes that digest the fibers and the roughage component. There's another group of microbes that are attack and use the starch component in the feeds. And you have to have a proper balance there, and you can't change those populations very rapidly. But the message is here, if you mess with the microbes, you do so at your peril. If you mess up the microbial population, you can have some problems that you really don't want to have. Number three on our list in our outline is to keep in mind that sheep need nutrients, not feed. So the nutrients they extract from the feed is what's important. 
Feeds are just a source of nutrients that the microbes and the sheep need. Nutrients can come from a wide variety of feeds. Normally we're used to, uh, you know, grains, forages like alfalfa, clovers, brome grass, etc. But they can come from thing, odd and unusual things. Uh, this year we'll probably uh, be testing those limits to what we can feed. Uh, I've got clients that feed some screenings, uh, oat hulls as part of their ration. One client feeds a lot of uh, bakery waste, uh, bread product. And it just tells us again that as long as we're focusing on the nutrients and balancing for nutrients, the source of those nutrients is much less important. So keep in mind that sheep need nutrients, not feed. And really that's why we balance rations. If you think of nutrients for sheep over on the left hand side, various uh, nutrients and classes of uh, nutrient material, carbohydrates, protein, fats, etc. And if you compare that to nutrients in, in, a, in your truck, gas, oil, antifreeze, transmission fluid, you know that your truck is not going to go very far when it runs out of one of its nutrients. You know, antifreeze in the, to cool the engine off. You get a leak in antifreeze, your truck is soon going to come to a stop. Same thing with a nutrient like a, like a protein or a vitamin like vitamin A that's very essential. Um, you will also know that no amount of one nutrient can offset the deficiency in the others. So when you run out of antifreeze, no amount of oil, gas, transmission fluid is going to keep your truck going. You can't replace it. It's very specific to the needs of that particular truck. And again, the nutrients we have for sheep on the left-hand side there are very specific to certain functions and metabolic processes within the animal. Low or missing just one nutrient will limit performance sometimes severely and may impact the health. So we've got quite a variety of nutrients there for the sheep, 20-some uh, nutrients that we have to make sure we have in abundance. Most of them can occur in natural feedstuffs, and we have to do a little supplementation to get them there. But in missing just one can really bring the whole system to a, to a halt. I'm often asked, you know, which is the most important nutrient? And I say it's the one you don't have enough of. You know, there isn't one nutrient that's more important. Even the ones that are required in very minute amounts, like selenium, in, you know, in measured in, in parts per billion. Uh, very small amount required, but if you don't have enough, the system can come to a halt. When we take a look at the uh, sheep need nutrients not feed, if we take a look at uh, the various feeds we have over on the left hand side there, typical that we find on a farm, you see the things that we normally feed like alfalfa and grass hay, high in protein, pretty good in energy, calcium, phosphorus, a few of the minerals there that I've mentioned. But when we have to go to a low quality roughage like barley straw, look at the drop in protein. You know, we've now got 4% protein compared to 10 to 18% in conventional forages. We're also low in energy or TDN, 44% TDN. Calcium is another one that's noticeably deficient relative to our conventional feedstuffs as is phosphorus and so on. Um, a supplement down there, I just put a supplement in because we're going to be talking about using supplements. And those are designed, again, to match up with the feeds you've got on your farm. But keep in mind that nutrients are important, but different feeds provide different amount of nutrients. And when we're going into a, a low-quality roughage situation or straw-based rations, we have to be very cognizant of the deficiencies that straw has relative to what we're used to feeding in a normal year. One of the tools we've got available to us is the Sheep Bites Ration Balancer. Uh, that's again a product that of Alberta Land Producers, one of the useful things that they've done over the years here. Um, and it's available at that, uh, uh, to try it out at www.sheepbites.ca. If you haven't had a look at it before, there's a good demo on there. But it really lets us do the, the bulk of the work of ration balancing. We're letting the computer program do the work for us. We can prevent nutritional problems using a product like this and we can certainly manage our feed costs. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, it's, it's pretty easy to use and a, a pretty good product that uh, is becoming more widely used and accepted by the industry. Okay, the fourth thing I want to talk about is know your feeds. Know what the nutrient content is. Know what the cost of those nutrients are in a year like this when we're trying to come up with some low-cost rations to compensate for high-cost uh, high cost conventional forages. It's much more important to know the nutrient content of the ration or the individual feeds when you're feeding close to the line or close to the requirements. So in this table I've used an example of an alfalfa grass hay, its protein level on average might be 14%, TDN 58%, and barley grain. And it's pretty easy to meet the requirements of the pregnant ewe for the last six weeks of, uh, of pregnancy. 
her requirements are about 11% protein and 64% TDN. So a hay grain combination that meets the energy requirement first, always balancing for energy first at 64% TDN, is going to result in a protein content of 13.8. So the combination of the alfalfa and the barley grain is going to give us a 13.8% protein content in that diet. That's well above, that's uh, almost three percentage points above what she requires. So in a normal year when you're feeding those kind of uh, normal feedstuffs, you're not feeding close to the line. You're feeding well above the line in terms of the requirement for protein. When we get into a situation uh, where we are feeding close to the line, and let's say we're using barley straw as the primary roughage, uh, barley grain then as the energy source, if we put together a straw grain combination to meet that 64% TDN level, we're only going to have 8.4% protein in the um, in the uh, combination of the two. So again, the pregnant ewe needs 11% protein, and uh, we're well short of that. What you would do is add a protein supplement of some sort to bring that uh, protein level up to 11%. But you wouldn't go beyond that 11% because of the cost of that protein supplement. That's a cash outlay, and you'd only come to that level. So you're only going to feed right to that 11% protein requirement uh, when you're purchasing expensive supplements. So what if the barley, which was listed at 12% on that previous slide, what if the barley was only 10% protein? What if the hay you bought maybe to replace some of that straw was only 12% protein rather than 15 as the book value or an average value says it should be? What, what would be the consequences of that? Knowing the nutrient content of your major feeds by taking feed samples and getting them analyzed is the way to answer these questions. What if I just trust that the feeds are average quality? What's the risk? Well, the risk of a protein and or energy deficiency in pregnant ewes is quite significant. The result could certainly be weak or dead lambs at birth, lack of milk in ewes that really can't be recovered with post-lambing feeding, no matter how good a job you do feeding after the lambs are born, you can't get back uh, the maximum amount of milk production when you've shorted your ewes in late gestation. We also run a real risk of compacted rumens if on straw or low quality roughage diets. Um, they, they have a desire to eat more and more because they are low quality and yet they don't have the nitrogen or the protein content that allows it to, uh, to be uh, digested by the microbes. And finally, we can have a weak immune system. Uh, increased susceptibility to infectious diseases is, is certainly one of the big factors. So as we continue on then, um, in knowing your feeds, feed testing as I said is the only way to be certain. If we are going to test core samples of baled forages, uh, we only want to have, we want to have a good tool now to allow us to do that. And one of the tools that's shown there stuck into that bale in the lower left side, 20 core samples is enough to get a good representative sample. If you want some more detail relative to the um, techniques around forage testing, how many samples to take and so on. Albert Agriculture a few years ago did a good, uh, a good uh, view, uh, a good video that's now mounted on, on uh, YouTube and you can access that by going to forage and grain feed testing as your search terms. You can also refer to page 49 to 58 in the sheep and goat manual nutrition module that we talked about. So a little more detail there if you want to go on and uh, learn something more about, uh, about forage and feed testing. So a good time to stop now uh, and have uh, some questions that uh, you might have uh, for me and I guess I'll turn it back to you Robin. Hi everyone. Um, give you guys a couple minutes here to type in any questions you may have. We haven't had any come in so far, so I'll just give it a couple minutes and um, feel free to type in your questions. Uh, Dale did mention um, 
testing your feed, just I'll take this opportunity to let you know that uh, on our website, ablam.ca, we do have a complete list of um, feed testing companies across Canada. So if you want to uh, download that list, you're welcome to. That's again, ablam.ca. going to give it one more minute here. It looks like uh, maybe we don't have any questions coming in. <laughs> one more minute in case anyone has any burning questions. We will have a question period at the end here as well. So if, uh, if you get up the courage to ask your question, you can wait till the end of the presentation. Just a reminder, um, these questions are all anonymous, so we're not going to read your name out and uh, it's, it's complete anonymity here. So feel free to ask whatever question you want about uh, feed. <laughs> Robin, one question we did have uh, come in uh, was relative to using canola forage, uh, canola hay if it was put up, or canola silage, and a concern about the sulfur level. Correct. Uh, that, was a, that was an excellent question because uh, the sulfur content of uh, canola hay or canola silage is more than twice the level of what you would get in a good alfalfa hay. And that is getting up to the point where sulfur could start to interfere with the utilization of other nutrients. Uh, could cause uh, perhaps even a thiamine deficiency uh, showing up in, in the sheep uh, at times. So generally I would suggest that uh, canola forage make up not more than half of the roughage portion of the ration. So for an example if you were feeding four pounds of, of roughage to the ewes uh, plus some supplemental grain in, in late gestation uh, you would not want to have more than two pounds of that roughage coming from your canola uh, hay or canola silage. And that's just a general uh, recommendation there. Um, there are ways of, of dealing with uh, higher levels if you have to, uh, if that is the only roughage source you've got. But as a general recommendation, keep away from straight, rough, straight canola as the only source of roughage. Great, thank you, Dale. Uh, we did have a question come in here. The question is, is pea straw a suitable feed for sheep? Yes, uh, another good question. Um, Certainly pea straw is probably the, uh, the first choice among all the straws that we have available here in Alberta. So if you can get pea straw, it's going to be a better feed for your sheep than barley, oat, wheat straw. And primarily because it's got more protein. Uh, pea straw usually comes in at 6-7% uh, protein content, uh, whereas the grain straws, the cereal grain straws come in around 3-4% to 4 protein and the digestibility of that protein is even, even less so than in pea straw. So yes, definitely pea straw can be used. Uh, again, 6-7% protein isn't going to be enough to meet the protein requirements of even a dry ewe, so you'll need something else to supplement a little bit there. And the energy is going to be less than what you would see in an alfalfa grass-based hay, but it's uh, among the straws, it's certainly the best choice. Great, thanks Dale. Uh, looks like we don't have any other questions coming in at this time, so uh, we'll let you continue on with your presentation. You got off easy this time, but uh, again, if anyone has any other questions, we will answer them uh, following the presentation. So over to you, Dale. Okay, thank you, Robin. So back to the, uh, the uh, slideshow. Okay, moving on here, tips for feeding straw grain rations, and you, we could say straw or any other low-quality roughage, such as a slough hay, um, that type of thing, would be in the same category. Uh, when I say straw grain rations, when I refer to grain, that's grain plus any needed supplement, and that usually means some additional protein there. So the first thing we need to do is uh, balance the ration, um, and this basically tells us we have to meet the needs for nutrients. As I mentioned a minute ago, protein digestibility is low in grain straw. Uh, the crude protein level is around 4%. Just to be safe, and because protein is so important when we're digesting low-quality roughages, I assume personally that there's no straw or there's no protein coming from the grain straw portion of the ration. When it comes to pea straw, I assume that there's 50% of the crude protein reported really is there in terms of being available to the microbes for, for their digestion. So again, protein is the big issue there. Adequate protein will ensure that we don't have problems with compaction and uh, those kinds of issues as well as meeting the, the needs of the microbes. 
The second thing, and again, balance the ration, uh, energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins. Again, recall from that one table how different straw was, how, how there were some serious nutrient deficiencies compared to what you're used to using, good quality forage. So uh, balancing the ration, again, becomes extremely important when we're feeding straw grain rations. As we're feeding um, grain, we have to be sure that we give the rumen microbes in, the, in that sheet time to adapt to grain. As I mentioned earlier, there's a different set of uh, microbes that digest starch versus roughages or, or fiber. And so as a thumb rule, I like to say that we should probably um, be feeding about a half a pound, uh, start off with a half a pound of grain, and you can increase that to the target level um, every three days. So increase it by about half a pound every three days. Um, the other thing you want to do is split the timing of grain feeding, so not more than one and a half pounds per ewe per feeding. Um, so if you're having to get up to two, to two pounds of grain, um, don't feed them two pounds of grain in the morning and walk away. Feed them a pound in the morning and a pound in the afternoon. Some of the rations uh, require up to three pounds of grain mix to be fed, and definitely there we don't want to feed more than about a pound and a half per ewe per feeding. Part of that is because we're, we don't want to slug feed that grain into the rumen and upset the microbes, but also part of it is that if we have some problems in fairly distributing the feed to the sheep, you know, making sure that each individual sheep gets their share, we're probably better off to do that in two feedings a day rather than just giving it all in one feeding. For every sheep that doesn't get her share, there's one other one in the flock that's getting more than her share. So again, we've got to be careful with how we manage our grain feeding problem, our grain feeding program there. And really, this is all about uh, preventing acidosis or preventing founder in that in that ewe, and that can happen quite easily if we if we get too much grain too quickly into that rumen. When we get into a cold snap, we should be increasing our grain mix by about 15%. And by a cold snap, I mean something that's uh, you know colder than minus 20 degrees Celsius would probably be what I would think would be considered a cold snap, and that's when we can increase the grain mix by about about 15% there. One more tip for feeding straw grain rations, and uh, maybe the most important tip, is that sheep can't eat as much straw as they do good quality forage. So in this table below here, we've got an example for a 180 pound ewe in terms of pounds per head per day. We estimate that she can consume about 1.5% of her body weight as straw. That would amount to about 2.7 pounds per ewe per day. With good hay, she could probably eat 2.5% of her body weight or 4.5 pounds. An excellent hay, you know, that second cut alfalfa, she can probably eat 3% or even more of her body weight or 5.5 pounds plus. So there's really a double whammy when it comes to feeding low quality or poor quality roughages. Lower amount of nutrients for sure as we've talked about, but also lower consumption or intake. And it all goes back to, you know, the harder work that the microbes have to do, the slower the rate of passage through that digestive tract, the less the animal can eat on a daily basis. So that's the double whammy that we have to be aware of when we're, when we're working with uh, poor quality roughages. A couple comments about what I think is the most critical period in the ewe's production cycle, and that's that last four to six weeks of pregnancy, that late gestation period. You know, this uh, Romanov view here that's uh, bagging up, she's, she's just full of lamb, she's going to have a lot of material there to deliver soon, and uh, we have to have fed her very well to get her to that stage in a healthy with a healthy outcome for both her and her lambs. If you take a look at these two uh, comparisons here, on the left is the cross section of a ewe um, that uh, is at uh, carrying a single lamb at um, day 88. And see if I can get the pointer going here. So here's the, the, fe the fetal material here. This is that single lamb growing in the uterus at day 88. And look at the size of the capacity she has then in her rumen here. This is the rumen here in cross-section. When we go over here, look at a twin uh, bearing ewe at day 139, so almost ready to deliver. Look at the amount in the body cavity that's taken up by the fetal, fecal, uh, fetal material, the, the lambs. 
And again, look at the reduction in the size of the rumen there in terms of how uh, how she can process feed or how much process she can feed. So I would say that that rumen capacity there is maybe half of what it is over here on the left. So question for you then is how useful is straw at this stage? And we're not sure. You know, we, we, we don't have a lot of research to go on that says we can feed a lot of straw at this stage of the animal at all. Uh, it's breaking new ground. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some balanced rations here shortly where the nutrients are in balance, but whether or not that you can really process much straw through that room at this stage is, is uh, a bit of an unknown for us, uh, even in the scientific community. So I did get rid of that uh, that uh, red ball. Good, uh, and we'll try to continue on. So when you're short of good when you're short of good quality forage, you really want to save any good forage you do have or can get your hands on for specific parts of the production cycle. So if you've got a limited amount of hay, green feed, or good quality silage. You really want to try to make that come into your feeding program during late gestation. Again, I feel that's the most critical time in the ewe's life. The second uh, area, the second group that you might want to feed a bit of good quality roughage to is your replacement ewe lambs. Uh, again, meter it out carefully because it's like gold this year, but your replacement ewe lambs are going to benefit from having that particular uh, bit of roughage in their diet. And finally, the third place, if you've still got some left over, is, is in early lactation. Uh, it's pretty difficult to get a lot of milk out of the ewes uh, if you don't have a, at least some decent quality forage, conventional forage in that ration. Now, not to say that there can't be some straw utilized in any of these rations, but uh, when you've got some of these better quality feeds available, that's where you want to put them. So it's important then as you develop your feeding program, your feeding system, not only to look at balanced rations, but to set up management groups. And this is important because we know that different sheep have different nutritional needs. That ewe lamb is still growing as well as uh, having a demand for reproduction. Uh, that ewe that's got in late gestation versus a ewe that's in early gestation or not even bred yet certainly has different nutritional needs. So just think about what stage of, of production your ewes are in and uh, set up groups accordingly to keep similar sheep uh, in a group. So set them up based on the similar nutritional needs. Again, feed the best feed only to the sheep that need it the most. Again, by grouping and separating, you can allow you to do that. And this also reduces competition for feed as well. Now, management groups that I think that should be basic on most farms, first of all, you've got your number one group there where you've got those strong ewes, body condition score three plus. Um, to keep the, sep the pregnant ones separate from the lactating, the pregnant one, late pregnancy separate from the early pregnancy, that type of thing. But you also want to minimize the number of ewes, a uh, maximum of 200 ewes per group, so it's easier to spot problems. So set up your groups that are not more than 200 ewes a group if you can, and uh, put that first group together based on their body condition and, their, and their, the strength of that ewe. The older, thinner, but still productive ewes, if you haven't gotten rid of them, if you think you can keep those through, then uh, go ahead and, uh, and work with them, but put them into a better, a better group. So if you take a look here, again, I'll try to get the, uh, the red ball down here, the spotlight. So look at this ewe, you know, that ewe there is much stronger and much healthier than the one right behind her there. Now this is after they've lambed out. You can see the baby lambs in this pen, but that's an example of, of ewes that you know, should probably not be in the same group together. Thinner ewe would benefit from a little extra group feeding and could still be quite productive as long as she doesn't have to compete with that stronger ewe. And don't forget different breed types when setting up your management group. Uh, one of the real challenges in, in a sheep operation is having some highly productive ewes like you see there on the left there with multiple potential for multiple lambs versus ewes that have singles uh, available to them. Now, so you want to make sure that again from a competition perspective, from a nutrient need perspective, you've, you've uh, made some separation there and set up groups there. Uh, 
So that's not to say here, I don't want to uh, say the Suffolk sheep is not prolific. Some of the Suffolk sheep are very prolific. But when you do have a situation where you know you've got only one lamb on the ground, then you can certainly treat that ewe differently than one that has two lambs or even three lambs and you're trying to feed them after lactation. So another reason for looking at separate uh, groups. Third reason is ewe lambs. Uh, ewe lambs can't physically compete with the bigger, stronger, older ewes. And as I've said earlier, they can't eat as much low quality roughage. Uh, they need more nutrients to continue to grow and reproduce as well. So in this pen, you've got some real strong ewes right up here on the front. Uh, good mature ewes, look like they're in pretty good body condition. Then you've got some of these crossbred ewe lambs like that one there and some of these back here that uh, look like they're, you know, they're much smaller and are going to have a difficult time competing with those, with those uh, more mature ewes for, for the groceries. So in addition, they have higher requirements and they have less ability to compete as well. Final comment uh, in terms of setting up useful management groups, uh, do the best you can. You know, from a practical perspective, there's water issues to be dealt with. It always seems like you need one more pen, but uh, do the best you can in terms of setting up groups that have similar nutritional needs. So a, car, a phrase I like to use a lot is the eye of the shepherd fattens the lambs. And this, uh, I think it's an old Scottish phrase that I've heard frequently, but but um, it just means that, you know, the shepherd's knowledge, wisdom, watching the sheep and so on is going to be real valuable to having a successful feeding program. And again, as I mentioned earlier in the outset of this, increased frequency and depth of observation is going to be required when you've, you're feeding unconventional feeds, lower quality forages, straw, etc. What you want to do is uh, ask yourself, are the sheep exhibiting normal behavior? They seem to be as active and, and thriving as they normally do. Are they eating what you expect them to eat? If you put out a bale of straw there and you expect them to eat two pounds of straw per ewe per day, try to run a calculation and see if they are in fact getting that much into their system, if that much is disappearing from them or from the, from the bale. Are they suffering cold stress at warmer temperatures than usual? So a ewe in good fleece uh, in the wintertime can quite easily handle minus 20, minus 25 if she's out of the wind and dry before suffering cold stress. If it looks like she's getting colder and uh, humping up and staying back and so on uh, earlier or, or at warmer temperatures than that, then you've got an issue there that you have to deal with. Are there any ewes lagging behind, showing weakness or lethargy? Uh, these are symptoms of compaction, where the ewes start to slow down and become less interested in life. And when you take a look at the picture here, you know, it looks like you've got those stronger, bigger ewes right here in the front. But what's going on with the ewes at the back of the flock? Those ones that are the last ones to come in for feed, uh, those are the ones you've got to keep an eye on in terms of your, uh, your shepherd's eye and watching what's going on there. So the eye and the hand of the shepherd fattens the lambs. Uh, some 20 years ago or so, uh, maybe even longer than that, a body condition scoring started to be useful in terms of livestock management. And with sheep, it's even more important because it's so hard to see through the wool. So body condition scoring only works if you get your hands on the sheep. So my advice, I guess, to anybody that's trying to winter their sheep uh, or even managing the sheep flock at any time, in, in, in even in a normal year, is certainly get to know the body condition scoring system. What the body condition scoring is doing is trying to measure the fat reserves over the spinous processes right there and over the transverse process here in the short rib area. This is where you're going to be feeling. And in those two areas, there's no muscle tissue. There's only wool, skin, or hide, and fat. So this is a good place to measure the fat reserves, which is a good indication of the energy reserves in that animal. So get to know your body condition scoring system and start using it on a regular basis. And again, if you're feeding, feeding uh, poor quality roughages, you want to be very diligent in knowing what your body condition score is like, what's happening there. Uh, condition scores run from 1 to 5. Uh, we, we target uh, 3 to 3.5 for use at lambing time, especially if they're used that are going to give birth to multiple lambs. A lot more information is available again on YouTube uh, and just put in the search term condition scoring of sheep and you'll get lots of, uh, lots of hits in that regard and can give you a real visual learning experience if you're not comfortable or, or using it right now. And again, the Sheep and Goat Manual, page 119, gives you some other uh, tips and some useful information on body condition scoring. 
And finally, I want to make a comment that use available experts. You know, uh, if you're not used to dealing with nutritional terminology, et cetera, reading and understanding a feed test report, that type of thing, uh, then uh, you know, be sure and seek out some help. Uh, these fellows both work in the feed industry. The one on the left there has a PhD in nutrition. Uh, that's not all that uncommon in the feed industry in terms of the technical representatives. Uh, most of them are pretty well trained these days. And so there's a valuable source of information. Yes, they've got a product to sell, but that's, that's good too because they can match their products with what you're trying to do with your feeds on the farm and come up with a balanced ration and a good feeding program. So that's one source of available expert. There's others available to you, feed company staff, as I've just mentioned. Uh, experienced sheep vet, uh, producers in your area, you know, look at the guys that have been around a while, the fellows that have uh, gone through a feed shortage before, that have tried different options and uh, seek out their advice. And of course your veterinarians are a good source of information as well on relative to health issues and some of them have taken quite an interest in, uh, in nutrition as well. And finally, the Ag Info Center, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry still runs an Ag Info Center. The, the phone number is 310 Farm, and there's uh, at least one individual there that I know personally that's uh, pretty good with sheep rations and that type of thing. So don't hesitate to use your available experts. Now, the final stop on this uh, talk this morning is to talk about sample rations. And here's where it gets to be a little bit risky from a nutritional perspective. You know, I hesitate to make specific recommendations without knowing, you know, the individual's farm, their feeding practices, and so on. But nonetheless, I guess to try to get some information out there that people might find useful, I've put together a number of rations here, 10 rations in total, as you can see, numbered 1 to 10 on the left, for uh, one, two, three, four stages of, of production in the U. And I've used, uh, again, some extremes here, barley straw, pea straw, barley grain, 35% uh, supplement that would be a commercial supplement, uh, very similar to what you would see with canola meal. It's about that level of protein, a little higher. I've also put some very good alfalfa hay in here. And the way you read these rations is you read from, from uh, left to right. So I've highlighted ration number one there. And uh, you can see, you can see that uh, this ration would be uh, 2.3 pounds of, uh, of uh, barley straw per day for the breeding ewe, a pound of barley grain, half a pound of a 35% supplement. Total feed is about 3.8 pounds um, as fed, which means uh, as as you store it over the fence, and that's about 3.4 pounds of uh, of dry matter. Dry matter intake as a percent of body weight, 1.9%, and the rough the ration is 60% uh, uh, roughage. So that's how you read those rations there. But again, you have to keep in mind, and in the handout, there's a number of, of uh, qualifying statements there. You have to keep in mind that this is actual intake, and there's no waste factor involved, and you have to consider how you might feed this product as well. So in that ration there, probably what I would do is feed the straw free choice uh, in bale feeders uh, or not, depending on how you want to feed it. And then you limit feed the barley and the supplement together. So you'd mix the barley and the supplement together and feed it at one and a half pounds per ewe per day in some kind of a trough arrangement there uh, so that you're getting a good distribution of that 1.5 pounds to all the sheep that are, that are involved there. So some practical questions around these average rations or these example rations that are thrown out there. And the first one uh, in these sample rations, uh, they are balanced for nutrients, but will your sheep eat these rations? You know, it's easy to balance with sh sheep bites and other ration formulating tools uh, a ration. It's kind of in the ballpark for what we think they will eat, but you really need to watch closely and see what they, they will in fact eat. And if they don't eat what you've got out in front of them there, then you've got to make some adjustments, otherwise they're not getting the nutrients required in that diet. Second question, how do you limit feed the grain, you know, one and a half pounds of grain, for example, in that one example, uh, without creating a stampede? You know, uh, it's difficult to walk into a pen of 200 sheep with a, with a, with a grain bucket uh, without you getting stampeded and uh, perhaps some damage to the sheep as well. So you've got to think about your feeding system there and how you get that into them. How do you ensure all ewes have equal access to the grain mix at every feeding? Think about that. Watch what's going on. Is there some sheep that aren't, aren't you know, getting into the grain and getting their share, and that's, that's going to be important. And then finally, a real difficult one, 
uh, in rations, sample rations uh, five and eight there in the attached page. How do you limit uh, feed good quality hay? So if you want to get a couple pounds of good quality hay into them, how do you do that with today's round bale feeding systems? Uh, one might be limit the access they have to the bale feeders. So perhaps put them in there for two hours a day and, uh, and then chase them out, get them out of that, uh, that pen where you've got the hay set up. It would be important to make sure that your bale feeders have equal access to all sheep in the group. Uh, alternate day feeding. Uh, day one is day, uh, you feed the hay. Day two and day three you feed straw, whether you're rolling it out or self-feeding it or however you want to do it. So there are some ways there, but uh, probably you're more innovative than I am in terms of coming up with some ideas on how you can actually get that product in there. Okay, so we're, we're basically on the home stretch here now. Um, uh, some summary points, you know, in order to end up with uh, the kind of positive outcome you see in that picture there, two healthy, strong lambs off that ewe, uh, what do you need to do? Well, you got to make sure that you cull down to what you can actually feed well. You know, that particular outcome is much more desirable than a pile of dead lambs come springtime. Know your feeds through feed testing. Uh, know your sheep body condition score, watching them closely, that type of thing. Balance your rations. When you're feeding closer to the line, when you're feeding right to that 11% protein requirement for gestating ewes, you've got to be know that your ingredients are delivering what they're, what they're supposed to and what you've got into the, into the formula. Use your experts, as we've talked about, and then work out a system that works for you. And uh, there's many, many different ways of setting up feeding systems. Uh, they're very site specific or farm specific. But uh, you're probably in the best ability, you have the best uh, chair at the show, so to speak, when it comes to setting up a system that will work well for you. So a copy of this article that was designed to accompany this webinar has been made available to you. It's also going to be on the Alberta Land Producers website. And um, uh, there's the, the address there. And I think that, Robin, uh, pretty well wraps it up. Uh, Thank you for your participation in this webinar and I'd uh, be happy to stick around and uh, answer any questions. Thanks so much, Dale. And again, that article is also in the uh, handout portion um, on your webinar control panel here. It will, as Dale said, also be up on our website. Um, We've had a bunch of great questions come in, and uh, so I'll ask those, but uh, another reminder here to uh, to enter in any questions you have, type them here. Dale's got a couple minutes here to answer some of these, and um, even if we go over, uh, we will make sure that all your questions are answered, even if it has to be at a later date via email or, or whatnot, we will make sure to answer all of your questions. So. Start off here with uh, one question that came in, looks like a follow-up to the canola question. Um, they had some feed tested. It's a grass canola hay bale. Sulfur is at, uh, looks like 42%, nitrates at 0.2%, good protein at 13.2, and TDN at 60. The sheep are due to lamb in a, one month. Is this going to be okay? Well, that sulfur number is actually 0.42% likely. Oh, yes. Uh, which, yeah, which again reflects um, uh, quite a high level. 0.42%, uh, uh, a normal uh, alfalfa hay would be about 0.24%. So you can see you're not quite twice the normal level there. Um, that's a hard question to answer for sure. Uh, we'd have to do some, a little bit more investigation in that, uh, run some numbers, see what the other nutrient balance is there to, to give a real safe answer to that specific question. But it's certainly you need to consult with uh, uh, one of your experts to, to determine if you're good for that. Uh, the rest of the stuff, the 13% protein, the 60% TDN, uh, that's all good. You know, again, you're above that 11 and uh, you probably need a little bit of grain in the last uh, portion of gestation, again, depending whether you're expecting a 150% lamb crop or a 230% lamb crop. But um, the sulfur issue is, is, would be a concern and, uh, you know, Robin, I guess if, uh, if we can follow up uh, after doing a little bit more research, uh, follow up with that individual and give him a, a better answer, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, great. So another question here, uh, with limited good quality feed, how do you reduce waste without worrying about underfeeding your animals? Yeah, and that's, that's where it comes to you developing your system. Uh, again, watching for waste, uh, you know, 
sheep are notorious at selecting and picking out what they like. Uh, they don't like stems on alfalfa, for example, and it's hard to get them to eat that. Um, but you have to you have to try to set up a system, whether it's your feeders or the frequency of feeding, to help them clean up as much as possible, and watch that they're all getting their their fair share. So it's a challenge for sure, and it's part of that uh, eye of the shepherd uh, common. Um, practices, setting up your system that, that they're so important from a management perspective. There, there's, uh, there's, there's not a computer program where we can crunch some numbers. That's really the aspect of getting the, the shepherd to do a good job. And that's where we talk about good feeders and sometimes not so good feeders. The good feeders have that uh, innate skill um, and usually overfeed, but uh, overfeeding is a little better than underfeeding when it comes to supplying protein especially. Okay. Great. Next question is, um, we've had some thiamine deficiencies in previous years. Uh, do you recommend automatically just giving a thiamine shot at birth? Um, there's, there's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, thiamine, at, uh, thiamine injections that you get available from your veterinarian certainly can be useful. Uh, you have to, it's probably better off to find out though what the cause of that is and see if we can correct the cause. So thiamine is one of the vitamins that the microbes normally uh, produce on their own and one of the advantages of a ruminant system. Uh, things that can interfere with thiamine uh, availability to the U itself then uh, would relate to things like uh, water quality, high sulfur in the diet, i.e. back to that very first question, can, can um, cause destruction of thiamine in the, in the rumen. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, a coccidiostat called amprolium can destroy thiamine in the rumen and, and you can run into problems there. So it's try, to, try to go back and find out what's the problem. Is it too much sulfur in the diet? Is it uh, amprolium as a drug that's used for coccidia control? Is it a weed in the feed like a horsetail, for example, that can destroy thiamine? And see if you can sort that out and uh, figure out what the cause is. And then another s possible solution other than injecting each lamb at birth is to actually put it into a feed supplement. So you can add uh, thiamine uh, uh, mononitrate into the feed supplement at a level that will boost it up a little bit and overcome whatever the problem is. So there's different ways of attacking it, but it'd be nice to know what's causing it and then you know how to specifically reduce, uh, affect it. Again, injection at, at birth uh, uh, can be a method that's useful. Okay, great. Another question here is, at, uh, at what extent can good quality hay that's expensive be replaced by grain if prices per pound are approximately equal? Yeah, and uh, you know, barley, grain versus hay, uh, probably, as, as I look at it, they're probably around that 10 cents a pound, maybe hay's even a little more expensive in certain places. So again, you have to go back to that, uh, that uh, chart where I showed the nutrients from the different feeds. So hay is probably a better source of protein than the barley grain, and if it's the protein you need, then that's the choice you would make. But grain provides about 50% more energy than the hay does, so if it's energy you need, TDN in the ration, then your grain is your best your best supplement or, or worth uh, the 10 cents a pound. So you really got to know what you're trying to do. Uh, if you've got low quality roughage, you probably need to do some of both. You, you could maybe the, some hay is good in that ration because you're getting that protein in there from the hay, um, but you probably need some energy, extra energy as well. So a, a ration that's 50% low quality roughage and 50% good quality hay is still going to be short of energy when it comes to late gestation for most ewes. That's why we balance the ration. You know, we'd, what one of your experts might do is run it through the ration balancing program and see what your best alternative is from a cost perspective as well as a, a nutrient balance perspective. Okay, great. Uh, I've got another question here relative to uh, feeding peas to sheep. Um, I guess this producer has had some problems with lambs going blind in the past, uh, might be related to the thymine. Is there a safe way of introducing peas? Um, so, uh, I guess these sheep um, sort of dig through the feed and eat the peas, uh, you know, and leave the barley. Um, mm -hmm. So is there a safe way of doing that or should peas be eliminated? Well, peas are a good source of proteins. You know, they're, they're probably twice the protein level that barley is, and they have about the same energy level. But neither one of them are a good source of vitamin A, and whenever we talk about blind lambs, 
the first thing we think about is vitamin A. So you have to make sure your vitamin A or your carotene is coming from some source there. Um, I don't, I haven't heard of any reference of, of uh, peas causing a thiamine deficiency. I may have missed that, but uh, uh, I don't think that uh, there's a thiamine issue there. As long as you're not overfeeding grain. One of the reasons, the other reason that I didn't think of when we talked about thiamine um, is if you've got borderline acidosis, so your lambs are on a high grain ration, maybe not getting enough roughage, and you've got some uh, borderline acidosis there, that can disrupt the metabolism and the production of thiamine in the rumen as well. So it's how you're managing the feeding process. Now how you get them to separate the peas from the barley, or stop separating the peas from the barley, is again one of those challenges and those things you deal with when sheep. You could try cracking a little bit and make the particle sizes about the same, but uh, darn little sheep are good at, at picking out what they like, and obviously they like the peas relative to the barley in this scenario. Um, you might, uh, yeah, again, I don't want to eliminate peas from the diet because they're definitely a, a good source of a lot of nutrients. Figure out how you can work with them. One producer I talked to routinely grows uh, peas and barley together for that reason, and he ends up with a mix of about one-third peas and two-thirds barley, and that's what he uses to quite successfully finishes sheep and, uh, and supplement the ewe flock as well. So I wouldn't uh, recommend getting rid of the peas, but try to figure out a better way of, uh, of eliminating the sorting. Okay, I just have one more question here. And uh, again, if you have any other questions, please type them in. If not, then this looks like it's the last question. And it's uh, a bit of a clarification one here, Dale. When you were talking about percentage of body weight fed, um, is that per feed as fed or as dry matter? Yeah, good point. That's dry matter. Okay. So we always talk, you know, when, we, when we want to consume, we can say like one and a half percent of body weight, that's, that's dry matter, yeah. Now again, with straw, you know, you, you've got probably 92% dry matter in straw, 90-92% dry matter in straw, so you're, you're pretty close to being the same, you know, by a, you know, a fraction of a pound either way, so. Okay. You could also get uh, variation from straw type to straw type that would be around that 1.5%. So wheat straw, I would suggest, would be less than that. Uh, pea straw might be more than that. Okay, and last question here. Is this producer feeds alfalfa hay and barley grain? Is it a good choice to have a straw bale for free choice? Uh, yeah, because alfalfa hay, especially if it's really good quality, you know, exceeds their, uh, their, their demand for nutrients for a lot of times of the year. So having the straw available there uh, certainly doesn't hurt at all. They'll pick away through it. They, they tend to like eating a little bit of straw. And uh, especially before lactation, uh, there might be a little bit of room for you know half a pound, even a pound of straw in that diet. So if you've got a way of uh, you know uh, of limiting the uh, amount of alfalfa you're feeding um, and making sure that all the sheep in the pen you know get get their share of alfalfa, what you don't want is the aggressive sheep getting the alfalfa hay and the less aggressive sheep having being forced to eat more straw than uh, than they normally should have to. Okay, thank you so much, Dale. Looks like that's all the questions that came in, and uh, I want to thank you so much for presenting this webinar with us on this uh, Saturday morning. It was my pleasure, Robin, and uh, good luck to all the producers in working their way through this and coming through with a good lamb crop in the springtime. Great. So I just have here one last slide here on um, what's next and, and some resources here. It's just coming up. Great. So for more resources, um, you can visit www.ablam.ca. We've got fact sheets, uh, management modules, past newsletters. All these are excellent resources um, that we have housed on our website. If you have any questions, feel free to browse our website there. If you're not finding what you're looking for, uh, you can email us at any time. Um, that's info, I-N-F-O, at ablam.ca or admin, A-D-M-I-N, at ablam.ca, and we will do our best to get the answer for you. And what's next? So our next face-to-face uh, -face meeting is Saturday, January 30th. It's a Meet the Board in the Lethbridge. We do have a guest speaker, Dr. Ed Pager. He's with the U of C, and uh, we're, we're happy to welcome him to that. And uh, we're also hoping to hold more webinars. Um, so when you finish this uh, webinar, we will be sending out 
an email with a survey. We hope you'll take the time to answer it because uh, we need feedback to uh, to make our webinars better. Again, this was our very first one. We hope you found it useful, uh, but particularly we're, we're interested in finding out what topics you'd like addressed in future webinars, uh, what day of the week you'd like to uh, you'd like to have them, what time of day you'd like to have them. So please do take the time to answer our survey. And again, we just want to thank all of you for um, attending our webinar on this Saturday. Hope you have a great rest of the weekend. And thank you so much, Dale Angstrom, for, uh, for giving up your Saturday morning uh, talking with us on feeding when hay is short. So thanks so much, everyone, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.